This is Health Links, and Health Links actually has Aging Strong in its under its scope. So Aging Strong is Tufts Medical Center's injury prevention and outreach program that aims to empower older adults. Today's topic is the five legal documents that all adults should have. And with me today is Robert Romano from the law office of Robert Romano. He specializes in state planning, Medicaid planning, and elder law. Rob, welcome. Good morning, Debbie, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me, Debbie. It's nice to be here. So we can't wait to hear about what you have to share with us because there's just so many different documents uh, out there that people say, oh, you should have this, or don't you have that? Or let me try to explain it to you. And sometimes with the word legal, people automatically start getting anxious or nervous. And uh, part of their hearing starts like to kind of like fade away because it's just too intimidating. So hopefully today you'll be able to share with us the five documents that you think and feel from your experience, everybody should have. Um, and hopefully from people's questions, based on what you have to share, we'll be able to come away from today and learning so much more and know what next steps we need to take. So let's see here. So the five legal documents, they, they make it sound so easy. Just five, huh? Yeah, just five. The fabulous, the fab five, we'll call them. Yeah. <laughs> So what what is there an easier way to kind of like break the five documents into categories so that way we know like how to kind of think of them systematically? Sure. Um, yeah, that is a good way to think about it, Debbie. There are there are like two categories. There are three that are more on the health care related side and two on the financial side. So if you think about it that way, three are related to health care decisions and um mm -hmm you know, your health and the other two are more financial. Um, so I think a lot of people think more about the financial things um, and don't know that they really need some healthcare documents in place, but it really is important to have kind of both sides covers, covered. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Especially with the healthcare industry being, it's just becoming more and more complex and um, people are coming in sicker and sicker. And of course, when you're coming in sick into the system, everything else, the documents that you have to sign just kind of seem too overwhelming. So you're just kind of signing your life away, not even knowing what you're signing for. So could you explain to us the three healthcare uh, related documents that we should have and really should kind of really know about? Sure. Yeah. So the three healthcare related documents um, are the HIPAA authorization form, the healthcare proxy, and the living will. So I'll just take a couple minutes maybe and explain what each one is and how each one works. But those are the three, um, the HIPAA, the healthcare proxy and a living will. So the first one is a HIPAA authorization form. HIPAA is abbreviated H-I-P-A-A. -A, and it's a privacy document, essentially. Um, the government came out with this many years ago. And basically the law is that um, any type of uh, medical facility, hospital, doctors, nurses, staff, or really anybody for that matter, is not allowed to share a person's medical information with anyone unless they have prior written consent. So um, written consent is this HIPAA form. So when most people go to a doctor's appointment or they're going to have a surgery um, at the hospital, they'll make you fill out a couple of forms. And usually it's this HIPAA form which essentially is like, who can we talk to for you? Or if you're unconscious or if something goes wrong, who are you allowing us to speak with? So normally people will fill out a form at a hospital at the time. But the problem with that is if you go to different hospitals or different doctors, you're always filling out this form and essentially you're doing it like uh, in real time or, or at the present time. But a better way to do it is to have your own HIPAA form in advance so that way you have it and you can give it to your family members. So that way, if God forbid anybody was like in an accident, they could already have this form and present it at the hospital so they could find out what's going on. So maybe I'll give it, maybe I'll give an example and make sure everybody understands it. And God forbid I got in an accident, let's say yesterday, cause I got to do some driving today, right? So let's say I got in an accident yesterday 
and I was rushed to South Shore Hospital. Um, and my family gets a call and says, hey, Rob was in an accident. So they all naturally kind of freak out. They don't know what's going on. Um, if anybody's ever been in this, um, you know, an unenviable position, it's not a nice call to get. And even worse is when you get that call, you don't get what the condition of the patient is. Um, you don't know what the diagnosis is, how bad it is. All you get is they're being rushed, in my, in my example, South Shore Hospital. So my family gets that call. They're freaking out. So somebody has to get to the hospital to find out what's going on. So my little brother lives really close there to there. And so let's say he was the first one to get to the hospital. He'd run into the emergency room and say, hey, my brother Rob Romano was in an accident. How's he doing? And due to HIPAA, what they're supposed to do is say, hey, who are you? You know, we can't just talk to you. We need permission to speak with you. And that's what this HIPAA form is. So if the hospital um, was to follow the letter of the law, if my brother didn't have this HIPAA form to show them that I gave him permission to find out what's going on with, my, with me or my information, the hospital is not supposed to talk to him. Now, you know, sometimes they can be... They don't always enforce it fully, but I have seen many, many times where they do enforce it. So this is a problem or can be a problem if your family needs to find out what's going on and you don't have a HIPAA form, you may not be able to get it. And obviously that's what nobody wants to be in that position. So mm -hmm. this is just a simple, essentially a one page form where you just list who you'd want to give authorization to, to find out what's going on. So for most people, it's their immediate family. So if you're married, it's your spouse. If you have adult children, it's usually your adult children. Could be a sibling. It could be a parent. You know, kind of like your inner circle of, I like to have it usually at least three to five people on the list, just so that there'd always be someone around, potentially, that could find out what's going on if you were ever, you know, in the hospital in this case. Hmm. And so uh, as far as, how often do you recommend for people to review it? So that way, in case, you know, a relationship has been strained and, you know, you don't want the upper person, the number one person to be called, you know, how often should a person review that? Well, you really don't have to review it as long as, it, you know, there's not any changes. But like you said, if you wanted to take somebody off your list or add somebody, then you can update it. Um, but when somebody like myself, when I do this form, I just save it on my computer, you know, as like a Word document, and then it's easy to you know, add somebody or take somebody out, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the way I do it and the way I recommend it is most other documents, and we're going to get into them, like the healthcare proxy, you name somebody first, like to make decisions, and then somebody second, like as an alternate, and there's clearly a pecking order. But on the HIPAA form, I don't do it that way. Some attorneys do, but I don't recommend doing it that way. I recommend that I say that all of my agents can act individually and or jointly which means they all have equal power. So if I have five people on my list, it says any one or all five can find out what's going on because I don't know which one of the five is going to get there first. So it's nice to just say, you know, any of them can find out what's going on. Not, you know, we have to try to reach the first person. And, you know, if we get their voicemail, then we have to call the second person. Or like that just, in this instance, we're trying to get information immediately. So we don't want to get hung up with any barriers. So it's almost like whoever gets there first, if they have this document, can find out what's going on. And then naturally in this day and age of cell phones, once the first person finds out what's going on, like in my case, if my brother found out, then he'd get on the phone, he'd probably call my mom, let my better half know I'm okay. You know, and the word would spread around my family that hopefully Rob was an offender bender, he sprained his wrist, they're taping him, up, taping him up, he'll be out in 10 minutes and everybody breathes a sigh of relief. But now at least everybody knows what's going on. So this is a very simple document. It's like a one-page document, but everybody should have it. Um, and then the other plus is once you have it, now when you go to doctor's appointments or a surgery, you don't have to fill out their forms. You just bring a copy of yours and say, hey, I already have my own. Here you go. And it just saves time, and it's a better form than what they give you anyway. Very good. So in a nutshell, you can pick anybody you want. It can be family and friends. Yep. And it's more for no, getting information. It's not yep. making decisions, but so it's getting only get, yep, 100% right, Debbie. Just access to information, finding out what's going on, and that's it. Nothing to do with decision making, just simply able to get information. But that's obviously the first step. 
mm-hmm. somebody gets in an accident, we need to find out what the situation is, you know, before it gets into any kind of decision making. I like the way you explain that. Thank you. All right. So what's the, is there any other information we need to know about HIPAA? No, that's pretty much it. That's it's called the HIPAA form. So that's, you know, pretty straightforward. Okay. So what was the other document that you um, wanted to share with us? The second one is the healthcare proxy. So the healthcare proxy is like a medical power of attorney where you appoint someone to make medical decisions for you if you can't speak for yourself. So this only comes into play if you can't speak for yourself. But any of us, like if um, we were going to have, say, a surgery and we knew it was coming up, uh, like, like let's say 10 years ago, I had a shoulder surgery. I knew it was coming up. So when I walked into the hospital that day, I brought my own HIPAA form so my so family could find out information if something went wrong, as well as I brought my own healthcare proxy, which says these are the people that can make decisions for me if I'm unable to make them myself. But I was awake. I was conscious. I was able to talk to the doctor before the surgery. So he told me what was going on. I said, yes, I understand this. You know, yes, I want this. No, I don't want that. Like I advocated for myself. But it could come a time where any of us are unconscious and we need someone to make a decision for us. And usually you'd want your family to do that. If you're married, usually it's your spouse. If you're single, it could be a significant other or it could be a child or a best friend or a sister or brother, whoever you want. But without this form, your family doesn't have power to tell the doctors what to do. So the doctors would essentially just do whatever they want. So especially for a married couple, like, you know, most of my clients are seniors. So you know, you tell uh, the clients that have been married for 40 or 50 years and the wife needs surgery and the husband, you tell the husband, he, you know, he can't, you know, tell, talk to the doctors about how to take care of his wife. You know, you might have a problem at the hospital because <laughs> the husband's going to be pretty riled up saying, what do you mean? That's my wife. But you need this form to legally for that husband to have power to make decisions for his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just a, an important thing to know that this um, doesn't apply in emergency situations. So let's go back to if I was in an accident in the HIPAA example and I was rushed to the hospital, if it was something more serious than my example, if I was really hurt, they'd bring me to the emergency room and the the ER doctors are doing whatever they can to save my life. They're not looking for, you know, who's this guy's healthcare proxy to make decisions. They don't care about that. They're like, we got to save this guy. So in emergency situations, you don't need this. This is more, okay, I got in an accident and I'm in the hospital um, I have to be in there for a couple of weeks. Now, a couple of weeks later, I'm still in the hospital and now they have to operate or something else goes wrong and I become unconscious. So not like an ER type thing, but just, you know, who could step in and make decisions at that point and maybe a not so urgent, you know, emergency situation. That's where this comes in. A mm-hmm. um, couple more things with this is that you always want to name in Massachusetts, you have to have somebody as a primary person. So unlike the HIPAA, where you could have a bunch of people just find out what's going on with the healthcare proxy, you have to name somebody first. You can't have more than one person. So it used to be you could, but now you can't. So sometimes I'll have like a single person with two children and they'll say, I want both my kids to make this decision. And I'll say, unfortunately, you can't do that. You have to pick somebody first and then have the other one as the backup, say. So there has to be someone first and then you can pick an alternate and then you can even have a third person as a second alternate. So you can have, you know, a peck. This one does have a pecking order of who's first, who's second, who's third. Um, and the other thing, last thing with the healthcare proxy is you can have an attorney help you with this, but you really don't need to. Um, it's a standard, there's a standard healthcare proxy in Massachusetts. So you can get one at any doctor's office can give you one. Hospitals can give you one. You can even get one online if you just Google a Massachusetts healthcare proxy. It's just kind of a standard form where you fill out your name, address, phone number, and then your agents, each of your agent, the person you're choosing to make decisions, the primary person, and then the alternate. You put in their information, and then you just have to sign this form in front of two independent witnesses, which means two non-family members, two people that aren't related to you, or two people that aren't named. Like You can't have one of the the agents that you listed as a witness. But so basically two people that are unrelated to you or the document just witness your signature and then it's in place right away. So if you don't have one, you literally could print one off the internet today, fill it out, 
have a couple of friends or neighbors sign it and you have a healthcare proxy today and you didn't need an attorney to do it. So there's really no reason why everybody shouldn't have a healthcare proxy if they don't have one already. What What's the criteria? I mean, there's some, I've heard people talk about, you know, they would say, oh, I can't have my husband be the, the first person because I'm not sure if he's going to be in any shape to really advocate for me in my best interest, or he might be too distraught. I need to have maybe my sister or my oldest son be the first one. And then maybe my, my husband be the second. Is there any type of considerations that people need to talk about? What are, what are they, if there's any, to, um, to choose these people and who should go first and second and third? Yeah, that's a great question, Debbie. Um, and naturally, a lot of this stuff, when you're choosing people to make for all of these roles in all these documents we're going to talk about, whether they're healthcare related or financial, you know, it's kind of common sense of you looking at the people close to you and who do you think may be a better fit for these different jobs? Um, you know, so on the healthcare side, um, you know, health is a factor. Like you said, if, if a, in your example, if a woman had a very elderly husband or he was like, had some health issues or he was in, unfortunately pretty bad shape or something like that, that, that wife might say, well, I don't know if I want to name my husband first, because I don't know if he'll be up to do the job because of his own health. Then at that point, maybe you do consider somebody else, but typically it would be a spouse first, just because spouses, obviously, you know, they love each other. They want to look out for each other. They want to be that, you know, protector for each other. But if health issues are that prominent, then maybe you do go to somebody else. But what I usually advise clients is I say, you know, I would generally choose, aside from what I just said, I would choose somebody that's good under pressure or that's not going to be, you know, overly emotional or, you know, if somebody, if, if you're going to, you know, one of your kids is overly emotional or cries too much or, you know, fl- you know, gets, um, is going to be a mess if, they, if they're talking to doctors and they, they can't, you know, hold it together. Um, then that's probably not a good person versus if you had another child that's maybe really good under pressure or stays even keeled and, you know, is better in that type of tense, stressful situation, then that might be a better choice. Um, Also, if you have anybody with a medical background in the family, if, you know, you have a daughter that's a nurse, well, you know, (laughs) nurses are pretty good with this stuff or a doctor or, you know, a sister that's a nurse or a brother that's, you know, in the medical field and whoever it may be, that's certainly, you know, kind of, again, common sense. Somebody has a sister that's a nurse, that's a pretty good choice because they know the ins and outs of medical stuff as well as they know hospital procedure and they can navigate, you know, in these situations pretty well. So I just tell people, you know, use your common sense. You know the people close to you, you know, who's best to be the primary person and then who would be best for the alternate. Yeah. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Okay, so that's the you've gone over the HIPAA and yep. the proxy. You yep. mentioned the third document, right? Yeah, the third one is called the living will. Um, so a living will is so this is different than a last will. Like most people think of a will as you know, like your last will and testament. That's the document um, who you want to leave your assets to or your stuff to after you die. That's different. That's called a last will. This is a living will, which is the medical document. We'll get into the last will in a few minutes. That's on the financial side. But the living will is a document where you tell your family, um, doctors, basically tell the world what your um, essentially final wishes are or what your end of life wishes are. Um, So, you know, this would come into play if any of us were in the unfortunate situation of being on, say, life support, um, you know, like our permanent coma or, you know, on a breathing machine where there's no hope, essentially, or, you know, something like in that dire situation where um, sometimes it comes down to that. And I've seen it, unfortunately, many times over the years. And the doctors of the hospitals would say, will say, hey, you know, mom or dad, or you know, whoever is is on life support, they're going to be in a coma. They're going to be on this in a coma and a breathing machine forever. They're never going to come out of it. Do you want to keep them on this breathing machine, uh, you know, on life support, or do you want to take them off life support? The slang term is some people say pull the plug. Um, so that essentially what this issue is. 
Um, so in a living will, you can let your family know what your wishes are. Um, so I would say most of my clients and my own says, hey, family, if I'm ever in this position, I don't want to live like by artificial measures. If there's no hope, you know, please take me off life support. You know, that's what my wishes are. Please honor that. So it's kind of like giving guidance to your healthcare proxy, um, to the healthcare agents, I should say, that um, you named in your healthcare proxy, because the healthcare proxy just gives people power to make decisions, but it generally doesn't tell you, tell them, excuse me, what your wishes are or what you want or what you don't want. So this living will, I call it a statement of your wishes where you're letting your family know exactly what you want and what you don't want so that it's in writing so that there's no misinterpretation. If this happened, you know, 10 years from now, um, you don't want your family fighting over, Hey, dad told me he wanted this. And another child says, no, dad told me he wanted that. And then, you know, when it's in black and white, when it's in writing, you know, it acts as a proof source as well. Um, so that there's not any you know disagreement amongst the family as to what to do. Um, it also makes it easier for the family, especially the person that's the healthcare agent um, named in the healthcare proxy, the person who has to make this difficult decision. If there's nothing in writing, if you don't have this document, and let's say you're a parent and you name one of your kids, and it says, oh, the doctor says, okay, junior, what do you want to do with dad? Do you want to leave him on life support or take him off life support? Now you're putting the, the weight of the world on that kid's shoulders to make a decision about his dad. And you know, either way, it's kind of a no-win situation for the kid. He's going to be sad either way. But if he takes dad off life support and he wasn't told to do that, he could, you know, carry that guilt with him for the rest of his life or he could hear it from other family members. So it's not a nice position to put the, the son in. Whereas if you had it in writing and you said, hey, family, hey, healthcare agent, this is what I want you to do. Please take me off life support. Now, it'll still be difficult for the son, but at least he's not making the decision. He's following dad's instructions. And he also won't be the bad guy because he says, hey, this is what dad told me to do. I wasn't my choice. I just did what dad told me to do. So for all those reasons, I think it's important to have it in writing. Um, and that's what the living will is. Wow. Well, well, yes, yeah, definitely. Now, as far as... I have a long time ago when I was um, taking care of patients at the bedside, we would have patients who are um, so sick that um, the doctors might ask, do you want to think about a do not resuscitate um, information or do not intubate? So yeah. DNR, DNI. So I could see those forms falling under the living will that you just talked about. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's a good point. So I kind of just gave you like the big picture of the living will, but there are more details in it. Like um, kind of what you said, like you can put in little things like, do you want to be, do you want to have, you know, tube fed hydration, you know, or not, or you can get more specific of types of things that you would want or type of things that you wouldn't want. Um, so that certainly can be spelled out. Um I also put in final wishes in this too, which are things like, you know, after I die, I want to be buried or I want to be cremated. You know, if I'm cremated, this is what I want you to do with my ashes. Or if I'm buried, I want to be in this cemetery or, you know, whatever, just so your family knows that stuff too. Um, but prior to all this, that's like end of life. In my living will, I also put some living benefits in too. That's what, at least what I call them. Um, and they go something like this. Now, you don't have to put this in. I'm just sharing you with you what I do in my practice. But um, most of my clients, you know, say to me, Rob, I, I hope I can. I want to live at home as long as I can. You know, uh, I want to stay in my own home. I don't want to go to a facility. I don't want to end up in a nursing home. So I put in language such as dear family. You know, I want to always remain living independently as long as I can. If I get sick, hire nurses or home health care aides to take care of me at home for as long as possible. And then if it ever gets to a point where I can't stay at home any longer, then at that point, put me in a facility, um, you know, that at the right level of what I need, whether it's a rehab hospital or maybe an assisted living facility. Most of my clients say, I don't want to go to a nursing home or I only want to go to a nursing home as a last resort. And then we say, we continue to say, if I end up in a nursing home, make sure they take good care of me. 
So then we put all types of examples of things that you'd want, you know, simple human things, you know, just make sure they're taking good care of me. I want all these different things um, so that you're dictating, making sure your family knows what you'd want at different stages. Um, if you're getting sick or getting just older or, you know, what type of care you would want. So that can all be spelled out in this living will as well. And then as you were getting at Debbie, before we get to this end of life choice, it can also be, you know, I do want this type of procedures or these types of methods, but I don't want these. Those can be spelled out as well. So this ends up being kind of a little chronological thing of, hey, keep me at home. I don't want to go to a nursing home. If I end up in a nursing home, this is what I want. This is the type of care I want. These are the type of procedures I want. End of life wishes, then final wishes. So I kind of put all that in just as a little roadmap for the family to follow. Um, but at a minimum... What I started with is the end of life wish. At a minimum, you should have that just so your family knows that. Mm, yeah. Wow. A lot of questions running around my head right now. <laughs> it's you know I love how you term that. Um, you know the the benefits and the the wishes for people who are you know who have accepted the fact that okay life is going to be ending soon and but I would love to have this type of life you know, adding yep. more quality. Um, that puts a lot more freedom and direction for the the caregivers, the family who is taking care of that um, person, which is great. But I could really also think about why it's important to have financial backup because the wishes can be um, too costly. And that's why I, I can't wait for you to share about <laughs> the other type of, uh, in, you know, you're going to be talking about the the financial part of um, the uh, what uh, adults need to have. But um, it, I could see different dilemmas there, you know, like the goods and the bad as far as following the the wishes. But I'm sure that's going to be a conversation that the person who is very mindful and thoughtful about writing these their living will and sharing it with the, those they love. So that way a conversation can start and not have it be like a, just a one-sided conversation that this person says this, so you got to follow it. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and that kind of goes without saying a, a lot of this stuff is not always easy for people to talk about. Um, it just isn't, you know, um, you know, most kids, when their parents say, you know, hey, I want to talk to you about my will or, you know, this and that. A lot of kids like, you know, I don't want to talk about you dying or, it, you know, it can be a little uncomfortable. But a parent just has to say, hey, I, I need, you know, people in place to take care of me or make decisions. So we got to talk about this stuff or at least the parents do to, you know, know who they want to have in place. So, yeah, yeah. it can be a little uncomfortable naturally. Now, is this something useful for people who are who live alone? who don't, who are single or who are widows and no children? Is this something also useful for them to have and who would they share it with? Yeah. I mean, this, I say these documents are really, um, you know, everybody needs to have them like adults of all ages. And it's not just seniors, you know, like young people, like I just did a, an estate plan for a couple that were, you know, say I don't know, late forties or so. But they had a they had a son in college, and they said, "Well, doesn't our son need you know some of these basic you know healthcare documents too? What if something happens to him at college? You know, so it's it's really all adults should have these basic documents." Mm -hmm. Well said, yeah, well said, because you just never know. You right. Never know. So, um, so the living will. Okay, so I just want to go back to the HIPAA. The HIPAA is getting information yep. you need people who can get that basic information about how you're doing, what's going on. Yep. And you have the healthcare proxy where you designate people and there's a, a tier one, two, three, yep. uh, who would answer for you in an event where you are not able to answer for yourself. Right. And yep. can, those people can also be the ones that can um, execute the, the living will, the, all the different asks and the wishes, right? 
Yes. And, and that's a good point. I should make everybody aware of this too. And, and that is in Massachusetts, the living will is not a binding legal document, meaning it doesn't have any legal weight. It's more, I call it a an expression of your wishes or a statement of your wishes. So it's more to give your healthcare, in Massachusetts, the healthcare agent that you name in your healthcare proxy has power to make all of these decisions. So that's the person that holds the power in the health, the person you give in the healthcare proxy. So what the living will does in mine, it's literally addressed to my healthcare agent as named in my healthcare proxy, my family, my doctor, et cetera. So you're saying, hey, healthcare agent, these are my wishes. I want you to follow them. But technically, the healthcare agent can do what they want. You know, but naturally, if you're picking someone close to you that you trust, you can pick anyone in the world. You'd pick someone that you think will honor your wishes and follow you, uh, follow your wishes. And if you give them the roadmap, which is this living will, you just make their job easier. So why wouldn't they follow what you tell them? It's kind of kind of silly to think they wouldn't, right? But legally they don't have to. So I just want to make everyone aware of that. But that being said, I don't think it's any less important because that person really needs to know what you want and what you don't want, as well as have this, they should have this as a document, as a proof source so that no one can really question what they did because you're just, they were just following your wishes because you have, you gave it to them in writing what to do. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of, in a way, fills in the blank where the healthcare proxy um, may be lacking because the healthcare proxy, you're naming the people who you want to speak for you, to stand for you, advocate for you. Yep. But there's really no documentation per se of the conversation, what your wishes are, right? So would the living will be the one that a person would look at and say, okay, according to this, this is what he wants, this is what she wants. And, you know, this is the way I'm going to, you know, proceed. Yep. Exactly right, Debbie. Okay. Very good. <laughs> I'm just kind of, I like reiterating because that's how I understand. <laughs> sure. And I, and I will say this too. Um, you know, as, as an estate planning attorney, I, I review a lot of documents. Like, you know, people come to me and they already have existing documents. So I see all different types and variations of these. Um in my practice, I do my healthcare proxy, like kind of um, almost like the standard one, which is just names who the agents are without any direction built in. I do the directions as this separate document as a living will, but I've seen other attorneys that kind of combine them. So potentially you could do a healthcare proxy with some of these wishes built in, you know, to that document and kind of combine them. So that's an option as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be two different documents. That's just the way I do it. But as long as you have those wishes, you know, um, spelled out for your family, um, I think that's the important thing mm -hmm. um, to the point where you don't necessarily need it to be a living, like a, what we call a living will. It's just the same information. So um, I've had clients like write a letter to their family in their own writing, but just telling them what they want. I've, there's all different types of uh, kind of workbooks out there. There's a book called Five Wishes, and there's other similar books where it's you just basically putting all this information down in an organized format so your family knows what you'd want and what you don't want. Mm -hmm. So whichever version that you do, it's kind of the same information, but just having something in writing so your family knows what to do if something bad happens so you get the care that you would want and take the guesswork out of it. For something like a living will, I mean, it's like it might be really hard to kind of think about all the scopes or every different um, parts that you might want to include in that living will. So having a workbook or maybe like a document to just kind of prompt the the thinking, you know, what do I want? Do I want this? Do I want that? So it just gets a person thinking about things, right? So that's yep. great. Yeah. So as far as so that's three documents. You mentioned there are two other documents and they fall under the financial part, right? Yep. Um, so the two financial documents are um, a durable power of attorney. And then um, the last one is either a will or a trust. So it actually could be more than five, but um, it's either a will or a trust. Um, so I'll start with the easier one 
Uh, we'll save that for last. So the fourth document, the first one on the financial side is the durable power of attorney. That's a document where you appoint someone to make financial transactions for you uh, or handle your personal business for you, handle your financial affairs if you ever need help. Um, so this could be if somebody's sick or somebody's in the hospital, but it doesn't have to be. It could just be an elderly spouse or an elderly parent, somebody that needs help, uh, somebody that's housebound, a parent that can't go to a bank anymore. Uh, could be a parent, unfortunately, with a disease like just dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, obviously, you'd need to have this before that while they can still sign things. But it could just it could be somebody that um, needs you to do help once in a while, uh, help only like an emergency if you're in the hospital or somebody that would need you to help, you know, all the time. Like if somebody's losing their memory or has some debilitating disease where they're not going to be able to manage their own finances anymore. The power of attorney appoints someone to basically step into your shoes and do anything that you can do financially from writing checks, paying bills, making phone calls about the cable TV bill or health insurance or, you know, anything we all do day to day, um, you know, making withdrawal from an IRA, um, moving money around, you know, anything that we do in our own worlds of, you know, handling our personal affairs, personal business, anything that we can do, you're going to name, you're going to allow, give the power of to your, your agent named in your power of attorney to do those same things. So this is probably the most important uh, financial document while you're living. This document only works while someone's alive. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, but once someone passes away, then the agent can't use this power of attorney anymore. So it's basically you're naming someone to help you either right away or if you need help in the future, um, you know, in case you're out of commission. So earlier I used, I'll beat myself up again here a little bit. I used the example of I got in an accident and I was brought to South Shore Hospital. So let's say it was a little more of a severe accident than just the fender bender I had earlier. But let's say I'm in the hospital for two or three weeks and I'm kind of out of commission. Um, if I'm out of commission, then I'm, I might need somebody to pay my bills or make some phone calls about my health, my, my health insurance. You know, is this MRI going to be covered or, you know, anything else that I may need to do? What if I was in the process of selling my house? I may need someone to sign, you know, the, at the closing for me, you know, whatever it may be, I would need someone to, you know, step up and take my place until I get out of the hospital in two or three weeks. So that's really what this is. Um, and so this, this does, um, you need to be uh, over 18 to have a power of attorney and the agent that you pick has to be over 18 as well. So you have to be an adult to, you know, in, be involved in this as, as you would. I mean, most people aren't, um, you know, choosing an 18 year old child to do this because they're kind of young. I mean, you could have a smart kid, but if they're a high school senior or a freshman in college, you may not want to put this on them anyway. Usually, I'm, most people that are in this role are in their 20s or mid-20s maybe. Um, but if kids are young, I would choose, um, you know, maybe a sister or a brother or an aunt or an uncle, someone that's older. You know, so usually it's somebody with a little more experience, um, maybe, you know, at least 25, 30 or older mm -hmm. to be in this role. And this, again, is a role that, you, you normally, you don't have to name, this one has a pecking order. So you can certainly name somebody first. Um, it can be more than one person, but then you'd clearly have somebody second, maybe even somebody third, but it's a pecking order. Um, I'll give you a couple of warnings, things I've learned in my last 17 years. If you do name two people, like let's say a single person with, uh, I don't know, two sons, and they're both equally capable and it's, say it's a mother with two sons, and mom says, I just want both my sons to you know, be my power of attorney together. That's fine, but just know that both of the sons will have to do everything together. So you know, they'll have to you know, sign checks, or um, if they're making transactions or doing things by phone, the financial institution may want to talk to both agents. So you're kind of tied at the hip. So it makes it a little more cumbersome um, to have the agents do everything together. 
but it obviously offers a little bit of more checks and balances where one can't do something without the other. So it really just depends on what your situation is and which way is better, um, whether you have just one person, which is easier, or whether you really do want, you know, two people to work together. That's a very good point. Very good point. Now, the person that you appoint as your power of attorney, yep. I'm sure they will have a legal document stating that they are the power of attorney. Should they, once they get that document, should they go to that that family or spouse or you know, friends bank to show that you are the power of attorney? When do they need to carry that document around? Or how does that, how would the bank know that this is a legit person? Yeah. So basically, who if you're going to try to use this power of attorney, you would have to show it to whoever you're trying to use it with. You know, so um, in my example, let's let's say that mother, the example I just used with the mother and two sons, let's say the mother chose I don't know, the oldest son first. It doesn't have to be that way, but I'm just using it as an example. If then the mother needed some help and the oldest son was going to use the power of attorney, say, to write checks, he would need to go to the bank and file that at the bank so that they, they have the power of attorney on record and know that he now will be writing checks. If he had a question about her cable TV bill, he may have to bring it to Comcast or whoever they're dealing with or scan and email it to them so they have it on file. Otherwise, they're not going to talk to them because what this gets around is we've all had the experience, I'm sure we're all old enough now, to know if you call some company on behalf of your mom or some other person, and you're not the person on the account, we all know it's talk to the hand, right? They're not going to talk to you. So what this power of attorney does is kind of takes the hand down. It's I'm allowing this person to speak for me. And by law, you have to speak to them and let them do anything that I can do. That's what the power of attorney does. But naturally, the company on the receiving end they have to have the power of attorney in order to honor it to see that you've given this other person, you know, power just for security reasons for them and for you. Uh, but they need to have it. So as you said, Debbie, this would typically involve getting the power of attorney to the company. So if it's a, like a local bank, you can walk in and hand it to them. But if it's a mortgage company out of California, you probably can't do that. So you could, you know, scan and email it to them or fax it to them. But once they have it, then they'll you'll be able to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good. So the one last question about the power of attorney. So the can that be, let's say the person who so a person got sick and they were in a, a coma for maybe a month. Yeah. So you they and they have a power of attorney. So during that time, that person is doing the financial transactions, um, paying the bills and whatnot. Then, you know, fortunately, the person gets better and the coma is, you know, no longer. And the person is able to, you know, do their own banking. And can the power of attorney then be suspended or can that can they be put on pause? You know, what I'm asking. Yeah. I mean, it, it can always uh, power of attorney can always be revoked. Like you can always take it away from somebody. But again, a power of attorney is a very important uh, and powerful financial document where you're allowing someone to make any and all financial transactions that you can do. So, you know, like a bank account, if somebody has $50,000 in a savings account, the power of attorney can go and withdraw all that money, right? Not that they would, but you're trusting your money to this person. Like you're trusting that they're going to do the right thing for you. Mm -hmm. In my power of attorney, I actually make the agents or I suggest, there's a, I usually say I have like a disclosure at the end of mine that says something to the effect of, you know, I understand I've been appointed as mom's power of attorney. Um, I have a fiduciary duty to do things in her best interest only to manage her affairs. You know, if I violate that, I could be held liable for damages or subject to criminal prosecution almost like you could make your agent sign something like that that says, hey, you can only use this to help me. If you run off with my money, you're going to go to jail type of thing. It's a little nicer than that, but that's the gist of it for some protection. But before we get to all that, naturally, when you're dealing with your family or people that you're putting in these roles, you're going to pick somebody that's close to you, 
somebody that you trust very well, right? So whether usually it's a spouse first or a child, if someone doesn't have a spouse or a child, then it's usually a sibling. If you have someone that you can trust or a best friend, you know, something like that. Um, so, you know, usually you're picking someone close to you that you trust. Um, if you don't have a lot of family or not, if you don't have somebody close to you, then I would be a little more, you know, leery of having some protections built in. Um, another thing that you can do is you could add something that we call a springing power to this power of attorney. Like when I was talking about this power of attorney, the way I normally do it is it goes into effect right away. Like if mom gave the power of attorney to son, the son could use it tomorrow, even if she's fine. It could because it goes in right it goes into effect right away. Normally, what I tell my clients though is you don't need to give this document to your agents right away because they don't need it now. Like usually I hold a copy of it and they hold a copy. And then if something happens, they tell their son or whatever, hey, I need you to do something. This is where my power of attorney is, or this is who my attorney is, or maybe you've already they've already given them my card. And so they know where to go if they need something, but they don't usually have it right away. So that's another little safeguard. But if you were appointing someone that wasn't so close to you, let's say you didn't have any family and it was a distant cousin who lives in Florida or something, he's the only family you have. And this kid's, you know, 25 and he's a little bit, you know, you don't know if you really trust him that well, but you need someone to help you. We can make this what we call a springing power that says this power of attorney only goes into effect if I become incapacitated and it's proven by a doctor, like a doctor says so. So like this power of attorney wouldn't take effect until you need it. So mm -hmm. that's another safeguard. So again, it all, this, all this stuff depends on, um, you know, who you're choosing um, and how close they are to you. If it's somebody really close, you don't need a lot of these safeguards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just read. Do we have some questions here in the chat? So, um, oh yeah, I just let me. I can address one if that's okay, Debbie. The last yeah, definitely. One. Please do. Um, it, the last one says, if you do your own power of attorney and it is notarized, if needed, would it hold up in court? Uh, the answer is yes. You don't necessarily need an attorney to do it, but it should be witnessed and notarized. So, mine, I have two independent witnesses, and I have it notarized uh, as well because. If you just do your own and it's signed, there's really no proof that you signed it. Um, then you might have an issue on your hands. So I recommend having it witnessed, two witnesses, and having it notarized. And it looks like the next, the other question kind of touches upon the next document that you'll be talking about, right? Yeah. So um, the the last document is you need some type of document. So generally, it's a will or a trust to tell the world who you want to leave your stuff to stuff is my legal technical word. I've come up with over the years. We all have stuff, right? Like we might have a house or a condo. We have bank accounts, maybe an investment account, an IRA, maybe some savings bonds, some jewelry, uh, some junk in our cellar. We all have all kinds of, you know, stuff, some more valuable than the rest. Right. But how does all this stuff get to your family? That's what a will does. A will says, hey, when I die, this is who I want to leave, you know, certain stuff to. Um, and that's what a trust does as well. So a trust will um, also get things or tell the world who you want to leave things to. It's just they go down two totally different tracks. Um, a will has to go through probate and a trust does not have to go through probate. So there are definitely advantages of a trust over a will. Um, there's a little more to a trust. A will is a simpler document. It costs less, but there's some drawbacks of a will. But you need one or the other to let the world know, you know, who you're going to leave your stuff to. So when people get a will, they usually have what we call I love you wills, which are things like we had a husband and wife here in Quincy that had two kids. Husband's wife will would generally say, I leave everything to my spouse, my wife, if she's living. And if not, then I leave everything to my two kids equally. And wife's is usually the, you know, the reverse. That's like the standard old fashioned will, but it doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to do it even. You don't have to do it that way. You can also make specific bequests. You say, Hey, I want to leave my sister, my diamond ring. I want to leave my son, my car. Like you can make specific bequests of who you want to leave certain items to. 
Um, so you can get as detailed as you want in a will, but essentially you're just telling the world who you want to leave your different assets to. The other thing that you should know about a will is that a will only covers things that are in your own name that do not have a beneficiary. So that means not joint accounts don't go by your will. So if husband and wife have a joint bank account, husband dies, that account doesn't go through husband's will because wife was an owner on the account. There were two people on the account. So wife instantly owns that account because it's a joint owner. Same as if husband had an IRA and he names wife beneficiary, husband dies. I think we all know when things have a beneficiary, it goes right to the beneficiary. We don't have to go to husband's will to say the wife gets the IRA because she was on the account as the beneficiary. So things that typically have beneficiaries are IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, any type of retirement plan, life insurance policies, annuities, um, all those things. You can have investment. Um, you can have investment. Um, I'm sorry, beneficiaries on investment accounts as well. You can also put a beneficiary on bank accounts. You can put beneficiaries on things like savings bonds. So literally, you could put beneficiaries on almost everything you own except for property. So you can't put a beneficiary on property. Um, so, but for the most part, you know, you could put, except for your home, you could put beneficiaries on everything else. And so when you die, those accounts would all go directly to the beneficiary. They don't have to go through your will or according to the terms of your will. But if you had just the house in your own name, and you die, now the house has to go according to the terms of your will, which means that will has to go through probate. And probate is a little bit of a, a lengthy process. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, you have to go through the probate court. It can, cost, it can take six months to a year. It costs thousands of dollars between attorney's fees and court fees. I think typical probates might be $5,000 or more. So you're paying all this money to get your own assets to your family because you had a will and it went through probate. Um, so, you know, probate is like, this, I'm sorry, having a will is important to make sure the world knows who you want to leave your assets to, but it's not the best way to do it. Um, that's where a trust comes in. A trust is just a much more efficient way to do it. Um, last thing I'll say about a will is if you don't have a will and you die and there are some things in your own name, like in my example, a property. If it's just in my name alone and I don't have a will, then it still has to go through probate, but you have to be subject to what they call the intestate rules, which every state, including Massachusetts, has like a chart of who's going to get your assets if you don't tell the world who you wanted to leave them to. So it's like uh, children, parents, siblings, uh, cousins, like it goes from closest relatives to more distant relatives. So the state would say, hey, well, you didn't tell us who you wanted to leave your house to. So we're basically going to give it to your closest relatives. So that may or may not be what you want, but that's what would happen if you don't have a will. Very good. Okay. So that's the will. So if we had a few minutes, I think I'd, I'd touch, touch on a trust because most people ask me about trusts and most people want to know how they work. So I, I think that might be um, you know, the, the advantage of a trust might be worthwhile for people to know. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, this hour is just flying by. I definitely have to have you back, Rob. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't, it always flies by. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'd be happy to come back another day, Deb, and I could talk more about trusts and, you know, um, why don't I just touch on the trusts now and that way just to kind of give people a flavor of how they work. So uh, first, the, the thing with the trusts are there are two types. There is what we call a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. A revocable trust is very flexible. Um, you can put things in the trust, take things out, et cetera. But the price of that flexibility is that assets in a revocable trust will not be protected from a nursing home if you get sick. The other type of trust is an irrevocable trust, or I call it an asset protection trust. This type of trust will protect your assets from a nursing home if you ever get sick. So property is a great thing to put in an irrevocable trust. If you have a house, especially with the prices of real estate these days, you have a price, you have a house in Quincy that's worth 
you know, who knows what nowadays, 500, 600, 700,000, and it's sitting there in your own name, that could be lost to a nursing home if you get sick. But if you had that in an irrevocable trust, it would be protected from a nursing home. Um, so there's a couple of things you need to know about an irrevocable trust. And I'm just hitting very small bullet points today just for time's sake, just to give people a flavor of this. But there is a five-year look back when you do an irrevocable trust. So if you put your house in this type of trust today, it wouldn't be fully protected from a nursing home for five years. Um, so you have to be aware of that. So if you're concerned about asset, asset protection and having a trust for that purpose, you really have to kind of get ahead of this and, you know, do it sooner rather than later or while you're younger, if you can, you know, if you're 95 and already sick, that's kind of, kind of tough, you know, but if you do it while you still can, you can try to protect your assets before you get sick. Um, the other thing with an irrevocable trust is you can't take the money out directly, um, especially during the first five years. Now, uh, there's an indirect way to get the money out after five years, but you can't take the principal out directly to yourself. So this requires some careful planning. Um, I could get into it more next time. But in a nutshell, the revocable trust doesn't protect your assets from a nursing home. Um, and the, the irrevocable, the asset protection trust will protect your assets or your home from a nursing home, whatever you put in there. But mm -hmm. aside from that issue, there are a number of advantages for either type of trust. So that's like the difference is really like the fifth thing, but they have four common, um, I guess, things that you would say, co four common features of, a, of, any, of either type of trust, whether it's revocable or irrevocable. The first one is either one will avoid probate. So before, if you had a house in your own name and you died, that had to go through your will, had to go through probate, costs 5000 If you had your house in a trust, it doesn't go through probate. So you save all that, right? And that's about the same cost of a trust generally. So like with everything else. So it's a better deal to have pro the trust just to avoid probate alone. Mm -hmm. Second reason you'd want to trust is the trust will protect assets for your beneficiaries, at least the way I do it. So whether it's a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust, when you leave assets to your family through a trust, it will be protected for them for the rest of their lives from divorce, lawsuits, nursing homes, business failures or any other bad events. When you leave assets to people through a will, there's no asset protection for your beneficiaries, but there is if you do it through a trust. So most people want to protect their assets for their children or loved ones. That can only be done through the trust. Third advantage of the trust is that you can make rules. Most people own a property. Um, a lot of my clients have children. But if you say, hey, I leave my house to my three kids after my die, well, now all the, the kids own one third of the house. You're going to hope that they agree on what to do with the house. What if one wants to sell it, one wants to keep it, one wants to live there? You don't want World War III. So in a trust, you would spell out, hey, this is the rule I'm going to make. This is what happens to my house after I die. So you could let the kids decide on one end and then have some safeguards if they don't agree. You know what happens, like then the house will be sold. Or you could just say the house will be sold, so then you know there's, everybody knows what the deal is. But you should have rules in your trust, whether it's regarding a house or anything else. The fourth advantage of a trust is it can have estate tax provisions. So estate taxes in Massachusetts start if you have more than a million dollars. So a lot of people do. Not everybody does, but a lot of people have more than a million dollars. If you're a married couple, a trust will help protect estate taxes or give you an extra million dollars, meaning you could pass on $2 million without any estate taxes instead of only uh, essentially $1 million uh, without a trust. But if you don't have a trust, then all of your assets are taxed with an estate tax if you have more than a million dollars. So if you have $1.5 million, the whole $1.5 million has an estate tax, which would be roughly sixty dollars to $65,000 on estate tax. Whereas if you had a trust with estate tax provisions, it'd be zero estate tax because now you can pass on up to 2 million without any estate tax. So another advantage of a trust. So, you know, obviously I'm, I'm doing this and talking about trusts in five minutes here at the end, Dev, but there's a lot more to it, but I just wanted to shed light for everyone to let them know that you need to have either a will or a trust. In the old days, everybody had wills, but nowadays more, most of my clients, most people I meet are choosing to have a trust just because some of those advantages that I just mentioned. 
Thank you so much, Rob. Well, that's it for today. 